The silvery white metal, soft and ductile element known as aluminum is also considered to be the most abundant metal in the Earth's crust. Its prominence has led experts to discover the use of aluminum in many items. These days, aluminum is a known component in making cans, foil, building materials and more. This element is gathered through mining and subjected to meticulous process before they become such. In today's Lord Gizmo episode, we will dig deeper into those processes. But before that, please don't forget to give this video a thumbs up and subscribe to our channel for more related videos. Even when aluminum is common, they are not found just lying around anywhere. They are acquired through mining areas that are known to hold aluminum. They need to acquire bauxite or the reddish rock with a high aluminum oxide content through mining. They start off by clearing the land through the help of these huge dozers and dump trucks. Then, they drill holes with calculated distances each. These holes hold the explosives they will use to break down the rocks in the area. After the explosion, the debris and broken down rocks need to be gathered together. For an area as wide as this, workers use the help of excavators and dump trucks to speed up the process. Then, they move the materials through specific techniques like side casting. This technique helps them move the excavated material to the side of the trench or pit they are digging. First, the machine dumps the materials slowly to the cut that they have made. Then, they make the second cut process materials further. The site can create up to 13 cuts for the stockpiling. They need to do this so they have a better way of storing materials when it isn't used and helps in managing dust. In any mining operations, especially the ones that use explosives, it is normal to encounter different sizes of debris. If side casting helps manage the smaller ones, stockpiling is a technique used when it comes to relatively larger ores. These ores are transferred to this area through the use of conveyor belts that move them from one point to another. They also use cranes and similar structures to assist in forming the stockpile. Once that is done, they will start loading some of these ores to a ship container. The goal of this step is to prepare the ores or rocks for a longer transportation to the processing facility. The containers need to be locked and secured to avoid any unnecessary loss while traveling to the port. Once it has arrived, they will slowly load the ores to a ship and deliver it to the processing facility. After some time, the carrier ship will arrive and will be bound for docking. In this case, the processing facility is in Gladstone and they now have to unload the bauxite inside the ship. Then, they take it to local refineries so they can turn it into alumina. The first step in extracting aluminum from bauxite is digestion with caustic soda. In this part of the facility, the bauxite is crushed into fine powder to make sure that they interact better with other components. Then, this machine, also known as a digester, helps facilitate the mixing of crushed bauxite and caustic soda or sodium hydroxide. The caustic soda reacts with the aluminum hydroxide minerals in the bauxite, causing them to dissolve. After reaching a certain texture, the mixture will be heated to a specific temperature and held under pressure. This accelerates the whole process and helps form the solution of sodium aluminate or the compound containing sodium, aluminum and oxygen. The process does not end there. The clarified products of the previous steps still need to go through further processing. Most of the time, they need to be transferred to another facility too. This one helps in the addition of seed crystals and calcification. To convert the sodium aluminate solution to solid alumina or aluminum oxide, it needs to go through precipitation. However, this will not happen if the tiny seed crystals are absent. So, they heat up the sodium aluminate solution to help it reach the optimum condition for this step. After that, they slowly add the seed crystals to provide a surface for the dissolved aluminum hydroxide to attach and grow. 
They use casting pans and other tools to speed up this process. As more and more aluminum hydroxide molecules attach to the seeds, visible alumina crystals begin to form. The process of calcification begins once the seeding is complete. When this happens, the workers need to separate the solution from the pan to gradually lower its temperature in a controlled manner. As the temperature decreases, the solubility of sodium aluminate in the solution decreases. This means the solution can no longer hold as much dissolved aluminum hydroxide. Consequently, the dissolved aluminum hydroxide starts to come out of solution and deposit onto the seed crystals, forming larger and purer alumina crystals. This is important for the later stages of alumina processing and aluminum production. The alumina crystals are then separated from the remaining sodium aluminate solution through a series of thickening and filtration processes. The recovered alumina crystals undergo washing to remove any residual impurities. The purified alumina is then dried and calcined at high temperatures. Now, let us talk about the final stage in preparing the anode for aluminum smelting. Anodes are large blocks of carbon used in the pots or electrolytic cells where aluminum is extracted from alumina. The first step is to prepare the pre-baked block of carbon or the pre-baked anode block. They are shaped and designed as such to make sure that the operation remains efficient even with such large materials. Then, they are moved from one place to another through the use of conveyor belts and machines that act as a system. Aluminium boasts some truly unique and unexpected applications. One particularly quirky use is its incorporation into fireworks. Aluminium powder is added to fireworks compositions to produce bright, silver sparks when ignited, enhancing the visual spectacle of the display. Another surprising use is in the manufacturing of artificial snow for ski resorts. Snow machines often mix water with compressed air and tiny aluminium particles, which act as nucleating agents, facilitating the formation of snow crystals. This process allows ski slopes to maintain ideal snow conditions even when natural snowfall is scarce. Additionally, aluminium is utilized in the production of reflective surfaces for telescopes and satellite mirrors due to its high reflectivity and low weight. These unconventional uses demonstrate the versatility and ingenuity of aluminium across various industries. Then, the steel rod is positioned in a precise location within the pre-baked anode block. This ensures proper electrical connection and alignment during smelting. Molten cast iron is then poured into a mold surrounding the junction between the steel rod and the carbon block. This molten metal solidifies, creating a strong and conductive joint that securely connects the two components. Anode rodding is crucial for creating a robust and functional anode. The strong joint between the steel rod and the carbon block ensures efficient current transfer during aluminum smelting. Moving further, this is the process of ingot production. Million tons of molten aluminum is poured directly onto molds. This pouring process needs to be controlled to minimize turbulence and ensure proper filling of the mold cavity. Since they are dealing with hot material, these molds are made up of cast iron or steel to make sure that they shape the molten aluminum properly. Then, they are left to solidify. Transferring the aluminum ingot from one point to another is completely done by these mechanical arms and conveyor belts. Their quality, weight, and other properties need to be checked by workers too. The previous clips you saw shows you how smaller portions of aluminum ingot are formed, but what if the facility needs bigger ones? This is how they go about it. First of all, molten aluminum is gathered inside this machine. Then, they proceed to purification of the material where impurities are removed to ensure the highest quality metal for the final product. Since they are aiming to create massive ingots for rolling, 
they also need to make sure that the surface of the ingots are equal. Aside from putting them in secure molds, workers also manually remove air bubbles or any debris that might have gotten in the way. Then they start off the casting process. In this step, Workers might use multiple ladles or crucibles to fill the mold in a controlled manner to minimize. This helps minimize or remove any turbulence. In this facility, they also practice the process of electrolysis to extract the aluminum that they need. The molten aluminum is processed inside a hot furnace and will be left there for quite a while. After that, they will achieve aluminum in its purest form, which is liquid at 700 degrees Celsius. This condition of the aluminum makes it easier for the workers to pour it into any shape or form. Finally, they are left with these massive aluminum ingots. Weighing 30 tons or more, the ingots you are seeing will be further processed and shaped in the next clips. This will help the facility achieve the desired use of the aluminum depending on the industry they are working with. A way to do this is through the process of rolling. As a preparation for further processing, the ingots will be transferred by these cranes and mechanical arms in the preheating facility. The temperature should be 500 degrees Celsius to reach the optimum state. Putting them inside this structure makes sure that both the inside and outside of the ingot have equal temperatures. The intense heat will make the aluminum ingot more malleable and easier to deform under pressure, hence making the rolling process easier too. Right after that, the ingots will be scalped. This is the process where the top and bottom parts will be shaved to get rid of any surface imperfections and impurities. Now, they have a mirror-like surface. Once again, the ingots will be preheated to prepare it for the rolling. After that, they will be forwarded to a reversing mill equipped with powerful rollers that squeeze and compress the metal as it passes through them. It is capable of reducing the thickness of the 44,000 pound ingot because it is powered by two 7,000 horsepower motors. This process will keep on going even after the flying shear cuts the head and tail off the aluminum slab. Even when the ingots are relatively thinner, the process does not stop there. They still need to go through cold rolling. The rolled out ingots will be cooled off to 200 to 300 degrees Fahrenheit. Then, they will be fed inside the two cold mills of the facility. This will help the aluminum reach its final thickness. If that is done, the aluminum will be coiled for the first time. At this point, it usually just goes for about one mile long. There's still so much to do in between these processes. However, after all that, what was once an ingot that measured 30 feet long and 21 inches thick is now a coil that can stretch up to 10 miles. Then, they start forwarding the aluminum to the fabrication department. This is where they prepare the aluminum coils for a wider distribution. To ensure quality control and a proper handling of products, each of the coils are labeled with unique codes. The final rolled aluminum product, whether a sheet or a coil, is then inspected, trimmed, and wound onto spools for further processing, packaging, and shipment. Rolling efficiently transforms bulky ingots into various flat aluminum products with desired thicknesses and widths. Now let us take a look at how aluminum rods are produced. A technique for making aluminum rods with a bigger diameter is rolling with drawing. The procedure is as follows. The aluminum ingot is heated to a thick plate, then it is sliced into strips the required width. The strips are then cold rolled to increase surface polish and reduce thickness, before being drawn through increasingly smaller dies. Through this process, the strips become longer and have a smaller cross-sectional area, resulting in a rod with the final diameter that is needed. Once the whole process is done, the aluminum rolls will be placed on stacks for storage. This will prepare them for market distribution or the transfer to other facilities.
Would you believe that this whole process actually lasts for six months or so? Yes, you hear that right. Before industries can even enjoy the versatility of aluminum, the processing sites need to patiently process them. From rocks, bauxites, to molten materials, and now to the finished product. This has been Lord Gizmo, and we hope you learned a thing or two. Before you leave, please don't forget to show this video some love by giving it a thumbs up, subscribing to our channel, and clicking the notification bell so you can get notified whenever we have new uploads. You can also tell us in the comments section what videos you want us to feature next. Thank you for watching and see you in the next video.